Americans have been called to be the keepers of the flame of liberty. And that liberty depends on innovative thinkers, the free exchange of ideas, and people with a can-do spirit. Elizabeth Clare Prophet, noted author, lecturer, educator, and religious leader, interviews revolutionaries in every field who provide the missing dimension to the news that affects you. The forum you are about to see was filmed before thousands assembled at the Royal Teton Ranch in Park County, Montana. Here, in a secluded valley in the heart of the Northern Rockies, concerned citizens of the world gather each summer to attend an international conference for spiritual freedom. They commune with life, meet old friends and new, and hear the flame of freedom that speaks through Elizabeth Clare Prophet and her guests at Summit University Forum. This week, Elizabeth Clare Prophet interviews Professor Anthony Sutton, the nation's foremost authority on U.S. support of the Soviet military-industrial complex. Their topic, the capitalist-communist conspiracy. Welcome to Summit University Forum, where the flame of freedom speaks. This evening, we're speaking about the Soviet Union and the paradox and the enigma it has been since 1917. Here is a nation that cannot build a computer on its own technology and yet has a most sophisticated space program here is a nation that hardly can care for the basic necessities of its own people and yet has munitions far in excess of the wealthier nations. The enigma of the Soviet Union has gone back to the days of the Bolshevik Revolution. For many, it remains an enigma, but not for our guest this evening, who is Professor Anthony C. Sutton. He is the nation's foremost authority on U.S. technical support of the Soviet military-industrial complex. He is the author of a number of books which deal with a Soviet conundrum, including his three-volume classic, Western Technology and Soviet Economic Development. Professor Sutton, welcome to Summit University Forum. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here again. Before we get into a detailed analysis of just how we built ourselves an enemy, as you put it yourself, I would like to pose the question to you of just a little bit about what the Soviet Union is doing today, and then we'll go and see how it got there. And that is, what is this all about, these eight failures of our space program? Was it sabotage? What happened to the Challenger? What details do you have on this? Yes. Well, there were eight um, American failures, but there were also three French, the um, uh, Ariadne rocket, the French rocket. They, so they also had three failures in a row. Statistically, uh, that that succession of failures would come about, uh, knowing what we do about the reliability of these rockets, statistically, you're looking at one in 250 million. Now, if you want to believe that one in 250 million chance is acceptable, then go ahead. I believe fully, and I wrote within a, within a week of Challenger going down that this was clearly sabotage. That's one point. Statistically, quite clearly it was sabotage. The second point is that, as you know, the Soviets always monitor from fishing, so-called fishing vessels, which are actually electronic espionage vessels. They monitor the, um, the launching from Cape Canaveral. Uh, they, they have these vessels offshore which, uh, radio the, uh, which monitor the radio communications. About two hours before Challenger left the launch pad, the Soviet vessels took off at flank speed. They left the launch area. The first time they've ever done this. So that's subsidiary evidence that the, the Soviets knew 
that Challenger, the launch, was going to be a failure. So you've got, one, the statistical probability, two, the fact that the Soviet monitoring vessels left the area about two, three hours before the launch, and thirdly, I understand from sources, the KGB had a big party in Moscow that same night. So those three points. I've got 10 other points I could probably make, but... Well, if the Soviets did do this, how precisely did they do it? Well, they have a variety of methods. You can take... Uh, uh, let me give, without saying the probabilities of each method, let me give some of the ways in which they could have brought about this. First of all, as we might get into later, we know the Soviets using the Tesla techniques for modifying the jet stream, for modifying weather. Uh, they had been modifying the weather, we suspect, uh, to the extent that particularly cold weather came down over Florida at the time of the Challenger launch. What does this mean? It, it has an effect on the, the solid fuel itself, and you always get a problem of vibrations in these types of launches. And there is a possibility that the cold air uh, created uh, perhaps an unstoppable um, uh, vibration, and these vehicles are really, they look tremendous, they look strong, but actually they're very susceptible uh, to structural failure. And given um, a certain amount of vibration, there's no question these vehicles will fail. Uh, so you've got one possibility, the alteration of the jet stream through Tesla techniques, plus their knowledge of uh, uh, vibration. Secondly, they, sh they could use laser weapons from offshore. Um, they could even use perhaps as something as innocent as a 303 rifle shell, uh, which would penetrate uh, uh, by the O-rings, and then I think the video shows a little puff of smoke coming out of the O-ring, and then, this, then the, the whole rocket blew apart beginning at that point. So there's a variety of techniques they could have used. I don't know which they used, but I'm quite sure they did use one of them. From inside of NASA? Or outside of NASA. Either way. Either way. It could be inside or outside. I, my guess, and it's only a guess, it could have been in combination uh, because uh, about six months before, the, uh, the Challenger blew up. And the, the series of uh, explosions began the previous August. So before even the previous August explosion, the uh, captain, I forget his name, but who was in charge of training all recovery officers on the, on the test ranges defected to the Soviet Union. That man knew the failures of every one of our rockets. He could have told that to the Soviets. He would, they would then know about the vibration weaknesses and uh, structural weaknesses. So it could have been done from inside in that sense through a defector. It could have been done someone at Thiokol, Chem uh, Thiokol Company. I rather suspect outside, outside or combination. Now, you mentioned uh, Soviet weather manipulation yes. as an a priori premise here, and we're going to get into questioning you about that a little bit later, because I think some people here are not quite ready to accept that the Soviets are controlling the weather. But that's what we're do they're doing today. And what I'd really like to talk about now is how it all got started with the Bolsheviks in 1917. It's very important for us to understand, first of all, that uh, capitalists and communists have, are not enemies. They have never been enemies. And uh, in my opinion, they're in a conspiracy together, which I've called the International Capitalist Communist Sp Conspiracy. And to that conspiracy theory of mine, uh, you have provided tremendous data and documentation over the years and you have brought that to the American people. You've told me in other interviews uh, that no one on the left or the right has ever argued with the facts. Oh yes, that's uh, true. And of course, I didn't know you when I was writing the books. I accidentally proved you right without knowing you or that you oh, made the thesis. yes, definitely. I'm not implying you wrote the books <laughs> no, deliberately of course. for me. And of but course, <laughs> this left-right uh, <laughs> left -right thing is nonsense. Uh, left-right is just a, uh, these are, uh, like horse blinkers, you know, you put blinkers on a horse to make it look down the road. That's what left and right means, is to control people's thinking. Some you put in the left packet, some you put in the right packet. But the truth, as you've just mentioned, the truth is that the capitalists and the communists are hand in hand, the allies, they're united. From before 1917, uh, capitalism has uh, built up the communism. 
uh, for one reason or another, which we might want to get into. It is a conspiracy. I think you accepted that before I did. I, I, I denied the conspiracy for years until the weight of evidence just made me accept it. Uh, academics are a little slow on these things. <laughs> um, we, so uh, we need I will like agree. You. We need As, what like you to said do today, that. I will accept a capitalist, communist, international conspiracy. There is no question about it. Well, my sense of it is that I could never understand the East West configuration and why our government, year upon year, would make so many decisions contrary to freedom, contrary to the best interests of our people and even of our allies. And I experienced this in a profound period of pain uh, when I was studying in Switzerland in 1956 during the Hungarian uprising. It left an indelible mark upon me to see those refugees coming into Switzerland and the Swiss uh, students holding uh, vigils in the streets uh, on behalf of the Hungarians and to, to think that our nation would allow the Hungarian people to be crushed. Yes. It changed my life, yes. that experience. We allowed them to be crushed and the Soviets, you will remember, behaved in a typical Soviet way. They promised that they would not intervene and then they intervened. It was a very complex uh, a deception that they a deception practiced. deception total. You've got the same thing in Afghanistan today where they, yes. with our State Department going along with it, where the, the Soviets are putting out the feelers they want to withdraw and our State Department is saying, well, this is acceptable. Deception. Glasnost is another deception, if we can come up to date. Once we uh, can agree upon a capitalist communist conspiracy, uh, then we have to study the nature of the power elite and the super rich and the people who have the feeling that they control the planet and that we belong to them and uh, we are uh, used by them to their ends. And I had a very interesting uh, speaker once who was a professor who had done a lot of research on the profiles of the power elite who very much uh, assisted my theory concerning the fallen angels in embodiment which we get from the texts of Enoch. So uh, that is one of the other components to my world view, which I don't expect people to accept. But I do believe that there is a breed and a life wave on this planet. Um, I believe that um, they have to do with a fall, a descent, such as the scriptures of East and West tell us, and that they have descended and that they have taken embodiment. Theologians throughout the ages have argued against this. Uh, because they don't want to accept that uh, there are evil angels or that they are in embodiment. But this is a type of person who has no national loyalties, mm -hmm. uh, who is capable of running large corporations and uh, starting wars, using wars uh, for effecting change and so forth. Uh, if you look through history, you can identify these figures and you can identify them today. So to me, all of that makes sense. What you have to bring us tonight, which I'm going to very much enjoy hearing you tell us about is the entire situation beginning in October 1918 with William Lawrence Saunders, chairman of Ingersoll Rand Corporation, deputy chairman, Federal Reserve Bank of New York, who told President Wilson, I am in sympathy with a Soviet form of government as that best suited for the Russian people. And as you know, the same year, William Boyce Thompson, another director of the Federal Reserve Bank, gave the Bolsheviks $1 million of his own money. So if we look at the actions of the leading capitalists of the time, people with names like Morgan, Rockefeller, we see a pattern of support for the Bolsheviks. Why did Wall Street support the Bolshevik Revolution? Well, you've got you can several possible answers. Um, they also supported Hitler, the very same people. So they support the left, they support the right. So you go back to the Hegelian dialectic, thesis versus antithesis gives you a synthesis. If they want a synthesis of new world order, they will get conflict. Conflict between apparent left, apparent right. There might be another reason that the capitalists want captive markets. Uh, they don't want to see the Soviet Union as another free enterprise, free society. And this is still the freest society in the world in the United States. So they, they doom these countries, whether it be the Soviet Union in 1917 or Nicaragua today, they doom these countries to Marxist dictatorship so that they can be controlled uh, from the economic and the political and financial viewpoint through what I see as the coming New World Order, the, the secular New World Order. 
So there may be a combination of reasons, and there's a deliberate creation of conflict to bring this about. So you have just made a rather shocking statement, and that statement is that American or international capitalists, as I call them, because they don't have any American loyalties, would prefer to have socialist and communist uh, captive states so that they can have captive markets. Yes, uh, these people are not American. They're internationalists, and they're part of being internationalists in their private conversations. And you just gave a quotation which I found in the um, State Department files from William Saunders, chairman of Ingersoll Rand, saying he thinks that uh, Soviet communism is the best form of, of uh, government, the best form of government for the Soviet Union. When you talk to these gentlemen, um, there's no question that they, they, they want power. And power in the political sense equates to socialism. Whether you call it national socialism or um, Bolshevik socialism doesn't really matter. When you get centralized power, centralized political control, that is what these internationalist gentlemen want. They do not believe, as I've seen them, in the American way the Constitution of the United States. They don't believe in personal liberty for you and I. And I was talking to a gentleman today who had worked in one of these corporate structures and he remarked how it was just like uh, a little socialist state where people are numbered, they perform numbered actions, they're little cogs in the wheel. That is what these gentlemen want. I don't see that as the, the, uh, the strength and the beauty of this country. That's why I've spent 20, 30 years running against them. Getting back to the Bolshevik Revolution, one of the ironies of it is that both Lenin and Trotsky were in exile one in Germany, one in the United States. Tell us about how, who helped them get where they were going to make sure that revolution was pulled off. Well, let me summarize about four chapters into four minutes. Uh, Trotsky was in New York. Um, he had no income. I, I summed his income for the uh, year he was in New York. It was about $600. Yet he lived in an apartment. He had a chauffeured limousine. He had a refrigerator, which was very rare in those days. He left uh, New York and went to Canada on his way to the revolution. He had $10,000 in gold on him. He didn't earn more than $600 in New York. He was financed out of New York. There's no question about that. Um, the British took him off the ship in Halifax, uh, Canada. I got the Canadian archives. Uh, they knew who he was. They knew who Trotsky was. They knew he was going to start a revolution in Russia. Instructions from London came to put Trotsky back on the boat with his party and allow them to go forward. So there is no question that Woodrow Wilson, who issued the passport for Trotsky, and the New York financiers who financed Trotsky, and the British Foreign Office allowed Trotsky to perform his part in the revolution. Now over in Switzerland you get Lenin, who was in exile. He went through Germany in the famous sealed train by permission and by, with the encouragement of the German general staff. And yet Germany and Britain were supposedly fighting each other. And you get them both moving these two key revolutionaries into place inside Russia. And then, of course, the rest is history. They created the revolution with no more than about 10,000 revolutionaries. They needed assistance from the West, and they got assistance from Germany, from Britain, and from the United States to continue and consolidate the revolution. Just tell us all over again why. Why? Just tell you don't it find again. this in the textbooks. Why is to bring about, I suspect, a plan to control world society in which you and I won't find the freedoms to believe and think and do as we believe. Did these uh, power brokers actually envision at that time a one world government that would be socialist? Yes. The second statement I made was that they did not want the Soviet Union to develop into another free enterprise society and that this would offset, offset it. Aging the revolution would offset this event. That was made as a statement in 1919. You have various books, one by Gillette, the razor blade Gillette, uh, the, uh, called The City, I think it was, which 
laid out this corporate socialism for the world to see as early as, what, 1905, 1910. So around the turn of the century, you begin to see actually written statements by these internationalist businessmen of the kind of socialist empire they wanted to bring about. It's there, but these books, of course, are not included in your courses in political science and history at the regular universities. Well, talk about the Red Cross mission. Red Cross mission to Russia, 19, uh, 1918. About 17, bankers, lawyers, businessmen. Well, yes, had a couple to do, of doctors. A couple of, there were two doctors, I think. Uh, there were two doctors. Uh, what, was, what was the mission? The mission was financed by William Boyce Thompson, the Chase Manhattan Bank, Federal Reserve System. The Red Cross didn't want to send the mission. The Red Cross said, we don't need a mission to Russia. They already have one in Romania, which was doing a good job. But William Boyce Thompson wanted this mission, and he put the money up. He financed it. And if you look, I, I printed a list of the people on the mission, and they were mostly bankers and lawyers, Wall Street lawyers, and people in and around the Wall Street establishment. The function or the purpose of this mission was to be in place to assist the Bolshevik Revolution. The Red Cross mission to Russia was a cover vehicle. It enabled these Wall Street elitists, these Wall Street manipulators to be there in place, and then I traced the cable one million dollars from the Morgan Company in New York to Petrograd. I forget to which bank, but it came from William Boyce Thompson, and which financed the revolution. And then they put pressure back in the State Department in Washington to actually send arms to the revolution, which went forward in 1918. And then I found in the State Department files, files an extraordinary telegram in which Trotsky appealed to the State Department to send American army instructors to train the new Soviet army. And I think I reprinted that in uh, one of my earlier books. So briefly, the Red Cross mission was a cover vehicle to enable Wall Street to be there in place to guide and manipulate the ongoing Bolshevik revolution. And what was the response of the State Department? Oh, yes, they were quite willing to send U.S. arm instructors. Do you know how, to what I don't extent? know if they went forward. I know the arms, I know the rifles went forward. I didn't trace the, the response to the telegram, except it was approved within the State Department. And I reprinted the telegram. I never did find a response. That's probably taken out the files. Do you know the figure to which uh, Wall Street supported the Bolsheviks? Well, it was $1 million. Just the William Boyce Thompson figure? Uh, that figure. But then you've got the other assistants. For example, the whole Siberian episode. See, in 1918, the Bolsheviks really only controlled Moscow and what was then Petrograd, which is now Leningrad. They could not have beaten off uh, the White Russians, um, the, uh, the Czechs, who were in Russia at that time, uh, the Japanese, who were anti-Bolshevik. They could not have beaten it off without assistance from the United States and from Britain. And the Siberian Railroad is critical because if you look at that map of Russia, you know, Moscow is, and Leningrad are stuck at the left end and you've got that vast expanse of Russia, which, and the, the backbone is the Trans-Siberian Railroad. Now, the history books will tell you that American troops went in, they occupied the Trans-Siberian Railroad in order to prevent the Japanese from coming in. Well, this is absolute nonsense. Uh, I've never written the book. I hope to get around to it one day. I've got two big boxes of files on this. The purpose of the American army in Siberia was to hold the Trans-Siberian Railroad until the Bolsheviks were strong enough to take it over. And they did, did that very effectively. They held off the Japanese. They held them back near Manchuria. They evacuated the Czechs out along the Trans-Siberian Railroad. The French and the British gave up because they said the Americans are helping the Bolsheviks. They evacuated. And in one of these books, I reprinted a little clipping from the New York Times of, I think, 1919. Finally, the Bolsheviks got to Vladivostok right at the, uh, the far end of Siberia, near Japan, in which the local commissar addressed the American army and thanked them for aiding the revolution. And that was in the New York Times, and I reprinted, reprinted it. Now, this is totally contrary to everything you find in the textbooks. The textbooks say we went into Siberia um, to at least be neutral and uh, 
I suppose most people would assume we went in to stop the Bolsheviks. We didn't. We went in to help the Bolsheviks. There's no question about that. But as I say, that's a book I haven't written yet. There's no question that they could not have consolidated their revolution without the capitalists. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. They had too many enemies. Not only, not only outside enemies, uh, the white Russians, they, they, uh, the Ukrainians themselves were not particularly happy. All the all your ethnic groups in Russia were not particularly happy with the Bolsheviks. They could not have won without Western assistance. There is no question about that. After the revolution, the West continued to, res to support the Bolshevik regime. Oh, right up to, what is the date today? July 1st, 1987. Mm -hmm. well, consistently, take it, consistently Let's take it step heavily. by step. Let's take it step by step. Fine. Go ahead. Well, uh, the thing is there's so much material. It's taken me, what, six books just to summarize it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and now I've got to summarize it in six minutes. Um, well, all right, we, we, the Bolshevik Revolution, we, we, we allowed, we aided Trotsky and Lenin to get there to start the revolution, we and the Germans. And then we, we, um, we held the Siberian Railroad for them. Then they were starving. The, the, the factory, they couldn't operate the factories because the Bolsheviks shot all the managers and the technicians. Either that or they left Russia. The factories were closed down. Russia was starving. By 1922, Lenin himself said the end has come. They had no food. They had these, uh, these uh, closed down plants. The plants were not destroyed in the revolution. That's what the textbooks will tell you, including Kennan, the State Department expert. He says the, the plants, were, the Russian factories were destroyed in the revolution. They were not destroyed. Why? Because I've seen the photographs after the revolution and the right in the Hoover Institution Tower. There are these massive boxes of photographs of Russian industry after the revolution. They, they could not operate the plants. So what do we do with Avril Harriman and uh, the Nash Chase Bank and National Bank and our old friends in Wall Street? They go in there. And of course the Hoover mission to feed Russia. We go in there and we have these 250, 300 concessions in which American companies went into Russia and they started up the idle plants. Harriman, Avril Harriman took the manganese concessions Armand Hammer, Occidental Petroleum, took the pencil factories and the asbestos plants. And all these top capitalists went in and they got Russia going on behalf of the Bolsheviks because the Bolsheviks had either shot or kicked out all the people who could run, all the Russians who could run the plants. Another point, that czarist industry was at a very high level. Your textbooks will tell you that czarist industry was backward. It wasn't until the Soviets came along that it began to make progress. This is absolute nonsense. The Soviets, uh, the Russians in 1913 had two indigenous Russian vehicles, Russian automobiles. There has never been an indigenous Soviet automobile of all come from the West. The Tsarist Russians produced an airplane in 1916 with a wingspan longer than the um, 747. This is not known today. It's just wiped out history. Uh, technologically, the Tsarist Russians were at least on a par with the rest of the world. They only began to decline when the Soviets took over. And then you've got the long history from that point onwards, how we got the first five-year plan, 1929, 1933. I look at the first five-year plan, I look at every plant that was built in Russia at that time. Every single plant was built by a Western company. Not one single plant was built by the Soviets. You name any plant, if there are any Russians here from way back, you name any plant in the first five-year plan, and you know as well as I do who built it. It wasn't the Soviets, it was a Western company. And you run down the list, uh, Caterpillar tractor. There are more Caterpillar tractors in the Soviet Union than are outside the Soviet Union. <laughs> Ford, Ford Model A, that, well, Ford built the, uh, the Gorky plant. That, and as soon as the Ford engineers left, they started to turn out military vehicles. Uh, you name it, in the first five-year plan, every single plant was built basically by American companies, but a lot of British, uh, French, and uh, German, were, and Japanese were in there too. Then the second five-year plan in the 1930s was a duplicate. They tried to copy the first five-year plan with their own resources. They fell flat on their faces, and they had to come back to the Western companies to, to, for assistance to duplicate the plants 
put in the first five-year plan. And for example, I was in Douglas Aircraft Company, they let me into their files, and it was amazing, the detailed assistance given by Douglas Aircraft, they bought one DC-3, and then they bought a, du a DC-3 in sub-assembly, and uh, all kinds of duplicate spare parts to get the thing going. And then we've got that story, I don't know how much detail you want, which continues right up to today, July 1, 1987, and you mentioned, I think, this morning, the Toshiba, and the, Nor the Toshiba Japanese plant, and the uh, Norwegian company, a government-owned plant, which provided the milling machines, which enabled now the uh, Soviet submarines to be 10 times quieter than they were before, and that's going to cost us $4 billion so that we can offset what we have given them. And this stupidity has continued for, well, stupidity in my sense. From the viewpoint of a Wall Street capitalist, I guess it's smart business. Uh, this has continued for uh, 60 years. And this supposedly by our allies, but this is not the people of Japan and no. Norway. No. This is again the internationalists. It's the internationalists. Toshiba represented on the Trilateral Commission, founded by David Rockefeller in 1973. It's your top corporate, corporate elitists your top corporate uh, establishment attorneys, the top politicians. Uh, Senator Mansfield uh, once said, you, unless you, you don't get along unless you go along. If you don't go along, you're like me, you're sitting here in Montana in the rain talking. Um, <laughs> we're not quite happy with that. <laughs> If you go along, if you go along, you've got to go all the way, like uh, Mr. Bush. Um, sometimes, uh, sometimes they stumble, like Mr. Nixon, who thought he was president. He stumbled. <laughs> uh, where did I, I? I think I went off track here somewhere. <laughs> what this brings up is the confidence with which these internationalists can usher in a world communist society. Yes. And that confidence must come of the belief in their own immortality that they will be exempt from this system when it comes in and they will continue to function the way they always have. You know, that's a fascinating point. You know, I've gone through so many revolutions. I thought, at first I thought they didn't know. I was very quickly pointed out they did know and for me to keep my mouth shut. And maybe we'll get into that later. I quickly found out they do know what they're doing. Uh, then I thought they were stupid, you know, that when the revolution came, they were going to get shot and, uh, you know, they'd no longer be Mr. Harriman or Mr. Rockefeller, and they were going to be shot. They seem to be impervious to that way of thinking. They don't seem to be worried. I'm more concerned about their skin than they are. <laughs> but that didn't make sense. So then I'm left with um, perhaps they had control mechanisms. Well, perhaps they were going to use rev um, technology and debt as control mechanisms. But if they're doing that, they're not being very successful because uh, it seems to me the Soviets are getting a little out of hand with their global imperialism. And I think the establishment has had to rethink its position on using technology and debt as control mechanisms. But you still come back to the point, why are they continuing to do it? And frankly, I can't answer that. What I do know is that if you face them down and tell them that they're committing suicide, they become very angry. And there's a classic case I had in England before I quit the establishment. This was back in 71. I was at one of these establishment conferences in England. Uh, you've got the representatives of the, the various bankers and the large corporations. And there's a gentleman there from Dunlop Holdings, Dunlop, the famous tire company. And I gave a paper on what we'd done to build the Soviet Union. And this gentleman, chairman of Dunlop, stands up and says, well, yes, everything Sutton says is right. Uh, there's no question. He says, I know he's right because we've been there and we've done the things he says we have done. But even if it is my own suicide, I'm going to continue to do it. Now, that man said that, and I heard him right. <laughs> so that's another enigma. Apparently, some of these men are willing to go ahead even if it is their own suicide. Who is going to say why? <laughs> Who is going to ask them why? They, some of them get very furious when you ask them. Uh, they become even threatening. I have a copy of a letter I'm going to reprint in a later book where a lady wrote to this gentleman, the chairman of the board of Mack Trucks, the big Mack vehicles, is now out of business. 
Um, and uh, the chairman of the board, Mr. Z I think it's Zenon, his name was, wrote back to this lady and said he will punch her in the nose if he ever meets her personally. <laughs> um, they get quite uh, upset when you point this out to them. But it does not explain the why. Frankly, I don't really know the why. Maybe they know they're going down for the count and they want to just enjoy it all the way. Very short-sighted. Uh, they're a strange breed of cat. Um, <laughs> I, I frankly... I'll say one thing, whether they're internationalists, whether they're Japanese, British, or American, or German, they all think the same way. They're internationalists. That's about all I can say about them. Well, what does Stalin have to say about how uh, we built his nation for him? Well, Stalin, in 1944, told Harriman, who was, Avril Harriman, who was then U.S. ambassador to Russia, that, he, well, he, he told the truth, for once. Um, he said that two-thirds of... Uh, Russian plants have been built by, I think he said, American or Western technical assistants. And the other third, he admitted to say the other third were copies of the two thirds. But basically, Stalin was telling the truth. Uh, but Abel Harriman uh, reported this back to the State Department, but he didn't, it didn't seem to worry him very much. He was still in the forefront of transfers um, long after World War II. What is the level of admission of all of this leadership from the Bolshevik Revolution to the present, their admission that communism does not work and socialism does not even work? Within the Soviet Union or outside? Either place. Within the Soviet Union, every so often you get what's happening today, the admission. The Gorbachev is admitting it doesn't. Everybody knows it doesn't work. Everybody knows it. The Russians know it. I know it. Uh, maybe your liberal media, the Washington Post is a little behind with its investigative <laughs> journalism. Um, but a socialist system does not work. It just plain doesn't work. Um, every so often they go through the rituals, Stalin went through it, the Lenin first faced it in 1922, Stalin went through it, uh, Khrushchev went through it. They all go through this process, they admit it doesn't work and uh, then they, they offer the bait big contracts and you get more Western assistance, more subsidies, more loans. We go in and we bail them out and we make it work. Socialism will not work unless there's a free enterprise system on the outside which enables it to work. <laughs> and you get the same in Nazi Germany, national socialism. Socialism again. If you go back to the 1933-1934 period, you'll find uh, General Motors, uh, you'll find General Electric, you'll find these big corporations pushing the latest in American technology into Nazi Germany. In fact, if it wasn't for the standard oil hydrogenation patents, which were transferred between 27 and 34, Germany could not have gone to war in 1939 because Germany has no natural oil resources. It has to convert coal. And standard oil had uh, developed a process to do this. So socialism, plain, does not work. It's a free enterprise system that works. This admission and therefore, the changing of the system means that this entire power elite no longer is in leadership. So they can't admit it, so they just keep going as long as Western banks and capitalists will yes. prop them up. Yes, yes, and uh, they, play, they play them beautifully. Uh, it was whining and dining in the old days, but now they've got, I think, more sophisticated methods which we may get into. I can't prove they're using it, but it sure looks like it. Um, they flatter these businessmen. Uh, they're allowed to take their corporate jets into Moscow airport. They give them palatial apartments, which no Russian has ever seen. They know how to play them. They play them like violins, and they get what they want. Quite who controls who, I don't know. I'm not going to totally believe, as many people argue, that Wall Street controls Moscow. The Russians are much too smart a people for that. There could be another form of control in process, too. They are too smart. Yes. They just let people think uh, that they think that they're controlling them. Yes. Well, you say in national suicide, 100,000 100, men died in Vietnam and Korea uh, by U.S. technical assistance, Western assistance. Why don't you tell us how we uh, brought this about? Well, we brought it about by making the rather ridiculous mistake of thinking you can separate civilian industry from military industry. Uh, we had these so-called Export Control Acts, 
we were allowing these plants to go forward to the Soviet Union, and we told the American people and the other people around the world and the free world that these were civilian plants. They had no military implication. This was absolute nonsense. Any single plant in the world has some military application. The Russians knew what it was, and they immediately converted it. Immediately. Now, I knew this, and um, this is a little aside, indirect answer to what you're saying, but it brings out some other points we touched on earlier. I'd finished the three volumes. I catalogued the transfers by 1970, the middle of the Vietnamese War. I catalogued the transfers from, in three volumes from 1917 up to about 1966, plant by plant, uh, technology by technology. I identified each technology, each plant in use in the Soviet Union. I traced the source of that back to, a Western, to its Western origin. Then uh, Stanford Hoover Institution was holding volume three in galley proofs. And uh, they held them in galley proofs for 18 months, which is not a very efficient way of doing business because you want to recoup some of your investment by selling the book. Normally, when you get to galley proof, you push that book out quickly to start selling the book. I got a little suspicious, and then I thought, well, there's a military application here, and I've been asked to keep out of the three volumes any implication that we might have assisted the Soviets militarily. Well, at that time, I was perhaps a little naive, and uh, I, I didn't have to take out too much because actually I had not looked at the military implications at that point. But I got a little suspicious why they were holding volume three in galley proof, so I started to look at the military implications. I wrote National Suicide without telling the Hoover Institution. And uh, because of what was going on in Vietnam, we had men being killed there. And they were being killed with our trucks, with our technology. And it was still going forward. For example, the Gleason plant was sending machine tools into the, uh, the Gleason works in New York, was sending machine tools into the Gorky plant in Moscow in the middle of the Vietnamese war. Those trucks, those armored cars were turning up on the Ho Chi Minh Trail. So I knew this and I was getting a little mad about it, so I wrote National Suicide and then Hoover tried to suppress publication of that. They didn't succeed. When you get to the military implications of the transfers, you find that the establishment becomes very, very sensitive and doesn't want this discussed. What did Stanford say about national suicide? Well, this goes back a little bit to the Republican Convention in 1972. Uh, where well, I'd given a blistering speech. Uh, it was morally wrong to, to support the enemy. We had men being killed in, in Vietnam, and we were helping the other side kill them. I said, this is morally wrong. And I remember those senators and congressmen sitting up there with blank faces. Nobody wanted to hear. They took the cameras out. Uh, they, all the copies of the speech went out of the press room. Uh, that, that was a complete censorship job, and that alerted me to what was going on, so I got... How did you get to speak to the Republican convention in the first place? Well, that was innocence on their part. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I guess I must look rather mild and reserved to many people. Um, that, was, that was a mistake they made. That was a tactical error on their part to get me there. <laughs> they never repeated it. <laughs> um, so then I could see the way the winds were blowing, and I wrote National Suicide. I didn't tell Hoover Institution I was writing it. They tried to suppress it. Uh, the publisher wouldn't back off. I wouldn't back off. I had a contract, so they couldn't fire me. Not right then. They did later. Um, <laughs> but um, I guess I just like swimming. I'm not like a salmon, I guess. I want to swim uphill all the time against the current. But, um, the establishment is very hostile uh, to any, dis or was up to very recently, any discussion of the military implication of technological transfers. But what you said this morning marks a change in the attitude because the New York Times had a long article on that Toshiba case. And the this was the military implications of technological transfers, which it would not have done 10 or 15 years ago. So very gradually, I think you may be seeing a sign of change in the establishment, but it has not gone far enough by any means. Do you want to tell us about Stanford? Well, Stanford was very pleasant. I was paid to write books, uh, do nothing else. 
And uh, when I came back from Miami Beach and I made this blistering speech, I thought, well, at least I've done something beneficial. Instead, uh, the director asked to see me and said, Tony, if you make one more speech like that, you won't survive. So I was a little uh, bewildered. I said, well, what have I done? I've just told them the truth. And I said, well, Tony, you don't say things like that. <laughs> um, so uh, then when National Suicide came out, uh, I was smart enough not, I, got, I learned a little bit. I didn't tell them I was bringing the book out. It was a trade book. And uh, again, I got hauled up into the director's office. And uh, first they argued it was plagiarism. I copied my three volumes. So I gave a very innocent answer. How can an author plagiarize his own work? <laughs> and that kind of stopped them cold. Um, then they said, well, anyway, um, um, that I couldn't write it because I was employed by the Hoover Institution. And I said, well, there's nothing in my contract which says I can't write this book. Then they dropped me at that point. They went back to the publisher. The publisher wanted to publish the book. He went ahead. That was Arlington House. And then in the end, they gave up on me. They, I got hauled upstairs again. And they wanted me to write, if I remember, a three-volume biography of Herbert Hoover, which would keep me occupied for maybe five years and out of mischief. <laughs> um, I declined that. And then the, they tried the, the bluffing routine. They said, well, you're no longer a fellow of the Hoover Institution. And then the next morning, my name and my secretary's name were removed from the personnel rolls. But what they didn't know is I had a contract. So I just produced the contract and Xeroxed it. I wasn't that stupid to give them the original. <laughs> um, and then by that time, I just had enough of this nonsense. And I left voluntarily about two years later and became completely independent. And that's about the time which I think uh, you ran me down. And not literally, <laughs> but... <laughs> I, if, I, if I could summarize, I think I'm a little stubborn in the search for the truth. Uh, uh, I, 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 can't say, I can't say that I've got the whole story in these books, but at least uh, I've got a lot of the story which is not included in what you might call your regular textbooks. Tell us about today. What is the technology from the West that's most identifiable, easily identifiable in the Soviet weapon systems? Oh, yeah, semiconductors. Oh, I, without question, semiconductors, because... Um, you know, today, electronics is part of everything. Microphones, television, everything we do. Same with military weapons systems. In, um, let me see, in the mid-1970s, and I've detailed this in The Best Enemy Money Can Buy, the Soviets could only make um, semiconductors on a laboratory scale. The reason is the manufacturing process is so precise, so sophisticated. You have to maintain very precise quality control. They could only make batches of semiconductors. But batches of semiconductors out of the laboratory is no good if you're making thousands and thousands of tanks and aircraft. They had to have a semiconductor plant. They didn't even know what to order. The first step was Control Data Corporation set up a technical assistance agreement. Control Data told them what they needed to order in the United States to set up a, a plant to manufacture semiconductors. Then the Brookhausen Network which was an illegal network, went about acquiring these individual machines, the ovens and the various calibration equipment, uh, very precise equipment for the manufacture of these extremely, um, well, this is the core of all modern technology, these little semiconductors. The Buchhausen network was, um, as a matter of fact, uh, Buchhausen has just been arrested in Germany. He was allowed to operate for 20 years. Just, just recently? Very recently. Uh, the Buchhausen network, which was an illegal network, acquired the equipment for the Soviets. And then one by one, they acquired the various pieces of equipment that were needed, illegally mostly, and then assembled the semiconductor plant in the Soviet Union. That is the key. Without semiconductors, they'd still be back with the old, you remember the old tubes, radio tubes? The same as Pravda in 1929 said that without Ford Motor Company, they'd stay in the age of the horse and the cart. And they would be. So we brought them into the 20th century, and now we've just pushed them into the 21st century. 
What about the whole affair of the grinding machines, oh, the, the ball the, bearings? The, the bar, Chuck and Grinder Chuck case. Chuck and Grinder Company. Merving their missiles. Yes, multiple re-entry vehicles. The, um, you can, you've got a choice. You can either put one warhead on a rocket or you can have multiple re-entry, independently targeted uh, warheads, maybe eight or ten of them. The Soviets couldn't do that because they couldn't make the extremely precise ball bearings that you need for the, the guidance systems for these independently targeted warheads. The tolerances, are, you're talking something like a millionth of an inch tolerance in these little, little ball bearings. We knew that 98% of these ball bearings produced in the United States go for military end uses. There's just no civilian use at all for these things. Made by one company, the Bryant Chuck and Grinder Company. In the, the early 1960s, the um, Soviets wanted to buy some. Chuck and Grinder Company was turned down by commerce at that time. Then along came, yes, it was first the Johnson administration, then the Nixon administration. And under the Nixon administration, the Soviets were allowed to buy, I think, 64 of these machines, which was one-third more than we had in the United States. The only end use is to move missiles. And Kissinger, no. These had a military end use. We allowed them to go forward. Kissinger what? He knew they had a military end use. He knew the only end use of these machines, the center line B machine, was to make these little ball bearings which, which move the missiles. Did he ever give answer to this decision? He allowed it to go forward. On the, another case, the Karma River truck plant, he admitted that it had military end use. I've never seen his admission on the Chucking Grinder case, although commerce and state by that time were arguing that it was peaceful end uses. It had been so infiltrated by these people. Okay. So they knew. They knew it had military end use. It's deliberate comes back to the first thing you said about conspiracy. I'd like to hear a, an alternative uh, theory as to why this continues to happen. I haven't found a better theory. I struggled for 20 years denying there was a conspiracy. On television, on radio, between audiences, I said, no, there's no conspiracy. But like I said, academics are a little slow. I can't find uh, any other explanation. If you go through the files, you go back, say, to 1918, I mentioned uh, Trotsky asked for U.S. Army men to train the Red Army. You see this time and time again. It doesn't appear in the newspapers. The politicians won't talk about it. The administrations won't admit it. There's got to be a conspiracy of silence. There's got to be. I'm not saying that uh, everyone that is a party to this is conscious of the overall scheme or of where what they're doing is leading mm -hmm. in the end. But I think uh, people are one at subconscious levels. Yes, I would say very few are aware of it. And most bureaucrats just follow orders. It comes back to the earlier quote uh, I gave from Senator Mansfield, if you want to get along, you've got to go along. Most people, unfortunately, want to get along, so they go along. They don't ask the right questions or the wrong questions. They don't ask embarrassing questions. This applies to politicians, to bureaucrats, to academics. Academics may be the worst of the bunch. You know, they want the little consulting jobs and that kind of thing. They don't ask embarrassing questions. There's no money, there's no percentage, there's no profit in asking embarrassing questions about transfers of technology. You can make more money by going along. It's a sad commentary, but I have to be honest about it. I'd like to talk about the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, the capture of the city of Kabul, and the tanks that made the 647-mile journey from the Soviet border over that rough terrain and how quickly they moved. Where did they come from? Where, well, the road itself. Let's the start road with the road. Let's start oh, with the road. road. <laughs> that is extremely tanks. rough terrain. Goes up what? 7,000, 8,000 feet, I think, some of those passes. The road was built by the U.S. Corps of Engineers. The Army Corps of Engineers. Yes, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Built the road. Built the road. Now, that's the north-south road. Now, the Corps of Engineers is part of the Pentagon. Anybody in the Pentagon must know north-south in that part of the world is an invasion route. I would understand an east-west road. 
But there are very few farms in Afghanistan that need a road, you know, for take vegetables to market. I don't accept that. That road is one of the finest engineering jobs in the, in the world, uh, built by the U.S. Corps of Engineers for the Soviet invasion. Okay, then you take the trucks. Uh, the trucks, the Karma River truck plant. Now, but, you know, you ought to back up a minute because so far we're talking about international capitalists and bankers. Now it's the Pentagon building the invasion route for the Soviets into Afghanistan. Where's the explanation? Well, let me, let me, the Pentagon's a puzzle. Uh, you have men there like Stephen Bryant, who unfortunately just left. Uh, Stephen who? Per, uh, Stephen Bryant and Pearl. Richard Pearl, Richard Pearl just left. These men are aware of this. They fight against it on a daily basis. They fight against transfers on a daily basis. So within the Pentagon, and they even have an office of uh, technology transfers, I believe, which is relatively new. They're, they're now cataloging and tracking this stuff. Normally within the Pentagon, um, they're aware of this. But the Corps of Engineers, I suspect, is more politically oriented they get into these water projects. And I think it's this political orientation that got them into this particular proposition. But again, they suspect that some general in the Pentagon would have objected, said this is an invasion route, we're going to make it easy for the service to invade in Afghanistan. Nobody protested, apparently. Do you want to talk about the tanks? The tanks. That came over the road. And the trucks and the gasoline, uh, the kerosene that uh, powered these vehicles, it came from Western technology. Now, I don't have the up-to-date data uh, on all Soviet tanks, but if you take up to, say, the T-55, they were using the Christie suspension. Christie's a good American name. Christie was an American inventor. Invented a tank suspension called the Christie suspension that was used on Soviet tanks up to the T-55, which is still operational. I don't know about the later models. I suspect they're still using it. The sights, the gun sights, uh, direct copies, direct copies of uh, the U.S. gun sights. Uh, if you look at the airplanes overhead, the the um, the radar, look down radar, copies of the U.S. radar. Uh, the gasoline, the kerosene, we find in plants using U.S. technology built by U.S. engineers in many cases. Wherever you look, come with a truck plant, whether you look at the truck, the tires, well, the gentleman from Dunlop, Dunlop Tire pointed out to me in 71 that he admitted uh, putting in the, the, uh, the tire plants for them. Wherever you look, it's the Western transfer of technology. Financed by American banks. Chase? Chase Manhattan. Uh, now, it's funny, the banks get a little shy uh, about reporting these loans. Um, for example, I understand that uh, the banks have to report loans to the Federal Reserve System, but they're not reporting these Soviet loans. The Soviet loans they're not reporting? Not reporting. Uh, they're very sensitive about this, very shy, as I say, embarrassed. Um, I can estimate in the last two years about maybe about a billion dollars has gone forward, has been, come from American banks. At, Unbelievable interest rates. I mean, I don't know what you pay for mortgages here in Montana, but in California, they're about, what, 12, 11, 12 percent, something like that, 10, 11, 12 percent. Soviets must be good customers because they're getting 8, 8 and a quarter percent. I don't know of any loan in the United States which goes out at 8, 8 and a quarter percent. In other words, they're in a better position than American taxpayers. And so that makes the American taxpayer the funder of the Soviet loans. Yes and guaranteed by the Export-Import Bank, which again is taxpayers' money. These are guaranteed loans. Under the heading of strategic trade, the 1984 Republican Party platform reads, by encouraging commerce in militarily significant technology, the Carter-Mondale administration actually improved Soviet military power. Because of that terrible error, we are now exposed to significant risk and must spend billions of defense dollars that would otherwise have been unnecessary. The Reagan administration halted the Carter-Mondale folly. End of quote. Who wrote it? Expose this statement of the platform. 
well, I don't know who wrote it, but it, it, it's nonsensical. It's absolutely nonsensical. Uh, so, I mean, uh, Reagan has done more than anybody else to build up the Soviet Union. So tell us about what Reagan's been doing and why has he been doing it? Well, just the loan example we were talking about, um, you know, I mentioned just, uh, just earlier. Um, you've got this operation called Eustec. Here we've got a new, completely new area to open up. Um, Eustec, United States Trade and Economic Commission. Founded in 1972 by George Shultz, who was then Secretary of the Treasury. Uh, Carter let it fall into default. In the Reagan administration, Shultz has brought back Secretary of State. 1983, he revised Eustec. Eustec in New York and in Moscow, beautiful offices. Um, eight full time Russian engineers in New York sorting over US technology with the aid of American corporations to, to decide what they want to transfer back. One of the first things that uh, Mr. Schultz did was to have the FBI remove the agent because the FBI, being interested in security, infiltrated one of the agents into the New York office of Eustech. Schultz told the FBI to take the man out, and so it's been an unmonitored situation since 1972. The FBI has not been monitoring it because Schultz... Same situation with the Moscow Embassy, where Schultz, I think, uh, made the statement, if I can paraphrase him, that it, it's a provocation to conduct uh, counterintelligence operations. In other words, to defend yourself against Soviet manipulation, against Soviet um, bugging is provocation, this kind of stupidity. Um, so the Reagan administration, through the vehicle of USTEC, the US, trade, uh, US Soviet Union Trade and Economic Commission, has actually increased the flow of technology uh, to the Soviet Union. We have, right now, 35 technical assistance agreements between U.S. corporations and uh, the Soviet Union in computers, all the way from computers to um, obviously in truck building, in many agricultural areas, uh, you name it, we're, we're doing it today. We're back where we were in the 1930s because uh, Soviet industry has got to be brought up to higher technical levels, they cannot do it without Western assistance, and this is still primarily the United States. So I see no difference between um, Herbert Hoover and Reagan. And here you get these so-called conservative presidents have been actually the most active in allowing these transfers or establishing the vehicles for these transfers to go forward. It was Herbert Hoover that allowed the, the first five-year plan to go forward. It's Ronald Reagan that allowed USTEC to act as the vehicle for coming transfers. In your book, The Best Enemy Money Can Buy, you say that the Reagan administration has a list of 150 Soviet weapon systems using American technology. What are some of the most important of these? I mentioned Look Down Radar. It's a terrain radar, so you can follow the terrain more easily without crashing into the ground. Um, you mentioned this morning Miller machines for these gigantic propellers. The, the, the Soviets have titanium-bodied uh, submarines, which we don't have. The, t much of the technology for fabrication of this titanium came from the United States. Um, I'm just jumping around different examples. The Soyuz, the Soyuz uh, docking system, where these two satellites come together in space and dock. The docking mechanism, the locking mechanism, is American. Is what? Is US. US. The US docking system. Now, they could explain that on the basis of ever the United States and Russia link up in space. They have to have a, um, you know, a common docking mechanism, I presume. It's, <laughs> There's a little weak argument given the whole history of these transfers. Um, let me see. Uh, basically, anything to do with um, advanced engines, advanced and internal combustion engines, um, anything to do with electronics fundamentally has come from the West. Computer and semiconductor. Yes. But we're, we're beginning to see a pattern which um, I've not seen before. And that is that the Russians are very capable people, very intelligent. They don't think the same way, way we do. They're saddled with this ridiculous system which we keep in operation. 
From the military viewpoint, I think the Russians are now beginning to use their ingenuity to take our technology and use it against us in weapon systems which are beyond the imagination of our own planners. And this, you get to the suicide phase, how we assist the Soviets, they will take this technology, they will, can restructure it into different forms, into different weapon systems, which we either don't have the imagination to conceive or that um, for political or corporate reasons we don't want to bring into production. That, that is a clearly where it's going right now. I think so. I think so. You know, Japan took wartime technologies, developed them for consumer products, and beat us out of the industries, yes. uh, whether it's automobile, Sony. Yes. A good example is Nazi Germany in World War II. Now, Germany is a relatively small country with no natural oil, very few natural resources. We've given them the, t well, we transferred the technology in the early 30s. And yet, technologically, I think the Wehrmacht, the German army, was way ahead of the US and certainly the British army and certainly the Russian army. Uh, you can take individual weapon systems. Uh, let me see, if you take, say, these um, little short weapons, the infantry weapons that, that uh, aimed at tanks, um, the US weapon was the bazooka, the British was the Piet, and then the Germans produced the Panzerfaust, I think it was called. Uh, the Panzerfaust was well ahead of both the US bazooka and the British uh, Piet gun for these projectiles. So um, you can take technology, and I think Nazi Germany proved it, and turn it on its originator in a military way. In other words, we have a precedent for what is happening now with the Soviet Union. Well, they have a greater taste for war, conquest, uh, than uh, our establishment has been able to focus on. So they have a reason to put uh, yes. hundreds of thousands of uh, researchers into this. Yes, but I'm afraid it's more deadly than that. They have a greater taste for war. They talk about fighting for peace, you know, which is ridiculous, really. How can you fight for peace? Unless you think of it in Marxist terms. Um, but they're more deceptive in their thinking. Um, Americans, I think most Westerners tend to be straightforward. Uh, the Russians have the ability to what I call double think. They can think in contradictory terms at the same time. Um, and this, like Glasnost, for the sixth time, uh, they're going to deceive us. It, you know, Glasnost's openness, and there's no openness. They've let out, what, a hundred prisoners from the Gulag, and there's another million back there. But the Washington Post, God bless, um, in its innocence, <laughs> sees these hundred, Zakharov and the others, and made these photographs, so we get the deception of Glasnost. We don't think in terms of deception certainly not in military terms, whereas the Russians um, automatically think of deception as, an art, as, a war, as a military form. How much is their strategic defense program de dependent on the United States? Well, I just mentioned the semiconductor plant. You could not have strategic defense without semiconductors, not in the slightest. So I'd say, uh, Would you say it's totally It's dependent? totally, yes, because what was the saying for the one of a battle? The shoe. The shoe, uh, without the nail, you couldn't put the shoe on the horse to win the battle. The semiconductor is the nail. Without that nail, you can't put the shoe on the horse. Without the semiconductor, you can't have strategic defense. Totally. Well, let me show you a video clip, and I'd like to ask you to comment on it, of transfer of submarine technology to the USSR the one by Toshiba and by the Kongsberg Company of Norway. Let's just look at this a minute. As the port city of Stavanger prepared to welcome NATO's defense ministers, Secretary Weinberger tried to determine what to do about the Kongsberg Company, one of Norway's largest defense contractors, and the Toshiba Company of Japan. Four years ago, they arranged for the illegal transfer to the Soviet Union of high-tech machine tools used to make submarine propellers work more quietly, thus avoiding detection. 
By misrepresenting the final destination, Kongsberg was able to ship computers to Japan, where Toshiba attached them to milling machines, which were then sent to the Soviet shipyards at Leningrad. Suddenly, U.S. anti-submarine forces noticed their listening devices were having trouble finding Soviet subs. In time of war, this could permit the Russians to play havoc with U.S. efforts to resupply allies like Norway and Japan. This is a severe loss that uh, requires remedial action, uh, and uh, without that remedial action, would give the Soviet an advantage they couldn't otherwise have obtained for themselves. To penalize the two companies, the Pentagon first threatened to block their exports to the United States. But then Norway and Japan began criminal investigations of their own, and the Pentagon now appears ready to back down most of the way. To keep U.S. markets open to Kongsberg and Toshiba, Pentagon sources say Norway and Japan may be required to contribute either money or technology to a major U.S. effort to reestablish anti-submarine warfare supremacy. Can I make a comment? Please. I think you would not have seen this uh, 15 years ago. So this is a slight change in a sane direction. You've got the Secretary of Defense complaining about a transfer of technology. They're getting worried, and for good reason. For good reason. But uh, it's a little late in the day. Where is it all going to lead? That's difficult to say because of several factors which you can't see very clearly. I don't know how far this trend of Caspar Weinberger is going to continue. For example, Schultz is still arguing for transfers. Uh, corporate America, like corporations around the world, Toshiba included, um, are still going to press for transfers. So. Although we see a slight change in direction, I think the main direction transfers are going to continue. Inevitably, at some point, that is going to, there's going to be a global shift of power. We shall then become increasingly under Soviet dominance. You can see that in Europe. Uh, you can see the Soviets penetrating into the Indian Ocean, into Central America, into Africa. They're feeling very sure of themselves. That's one thing. Secondly, you've got a whole new area of weapons systems, which I suspect are being used, in fact, I know are being used. We apparently, officially, don't even know they're being used on us. This whole area of psychotronic warfare, uh, we, uh, we know it's being used. But when you look at, say, the reactions of State Department, uh, they act as if it is not being used. So, when I say that that was a hopeful sign that you just saw, Weinberger commenting on Toshiba, that is so small compared with what is needed that it's not going to turn the tide. What do I see ahead? I see a, a showdown coming with the West and the Soviet Union, maybe around the year 2000, 2010. What kind of a showdown? Bluff, bluff. They'll be preceded by psychotronic warfare. They will, they will uh, behavioral modification of our leaders. Uh, Soviet Union actually is a very weak country. I mean, uh, we could, I suppose, if we wanted to neutralize it. I could see a, a gigantic bluff in which the U.S. is told uh, to surrender, or it'll be uh, atom bombed. And I think with behavioral modification, that they could well twist a, uh, a surrender out of a uh, compliant administration in Washington. After all, you've got, uh, who was it, uh, Hart, I've forgotten his first name. Gary Hart. Um, Gary Hart. Yeah, I think we owe the, the lady a, a, a thank you. <laughs> um, because I would dread to think of a man like Gary Hart uh, in the White House and being faced by a Soviet threat. The man would collapse like that. Um, politicians are weak by nature, they're compromisers. And the Soviets know that. And you get a combination of the political, political makeup plus psychotronic warfare. I can see uh, a bluff being uh, pulled off in 10, 20 years. As far as the order is concerned, many people here have read 
everything you've written about the order and as a result of that have an even better understanding of how the power elite has worked uh, to produce crisis for change, etc. You want to tell us a little about your research at Yale? The order, um, that came about in a very interesting way. As I freely admitted guilt, um, I said there was no conspiracy for 20 years. I must have said it before millions of people. And then one day, and this is exactly how it happened, I got a package in the mail anonymously. And I opened it, and it was a, it was a membership list of the Skull and Bones, which is a totally secret organization, Skull and Bones at Yale University. And I, I kind of looked through it, and I thought, well, you know, I can't do much with this. And I put it on one side, and I regret to say it sat in a storage box for two years. And then one day out of curiosity, I pulled it out, and I ran my eye down the names of the members, of those who had been members of Skull and Bones. And then it began to hit me. This was the establishment. I was getting names like Harriman, Stimson, Bundy, Bush, Aldrich, all the top names in the establishment. Not all of them, but, but enough to make me extremely curious. So I looked a little more uh, at the package that was sent to me, and I've, what, this is roughly what I found, that Skull and Bones was founded 1833 at Yale University, only at Yale University. It's a chapter of a German secret society, which is not identified. Uh, there were some photographs of um, the members, and uh, particularly, they, they divided into clubs. Each year, uh, 15 Yale men in their senior year, this is an all-male organization, in their senior year, 15 men are selected by the previous club. So. Um, it is a self-perpetuating organization. They seem to be selected on the basis of uh, athletic ability, but particularly their willingness to go along, with the, to play, make a team effort, to play the, play the game. Because in, it, in the package I got were some notes on who might be selected uh, for the following year, and these little handwritten notes gave the, the attributes of various people and I was able to infer what they were looking for. So you've got this secret society, which 1833, a new club each year, and each club has a designation like D182, D183. Um, I had the complete membership list. Uh, they were even kind enough to enclose the various invitations to the meetings they hold secretly each Thursday evening, apparently, with the skull and, po skull and bones prominently displayed on the announcement form. And I was able they also gave me uh, lists going back to 1833, and I was able to find they're using the same skull and bones in the early, the mid 1800s as they are today, the same imprint. Um, then later, I got an update. So actually what I have is a membership list uh, from 1833 up to today, all members of skull and bones. Completely secret society. It is so secret that if you're a member of skull and bones, you may not remain in the room while it is under discussion. You have to walk out. This was tested for me by a newspaper reporter who cornered uh, George McBundy. The, uh, the Bundy family is prominent in the order. He cornered Bundy at a meeting down in Irvine, California, and started to discuss Skull and Bones, and of course Bundy walked away. They tested it on um, William Buckley, who's also a member. William Buckley called me a name, which I won't repeat here, <laughs> apparently for doing what comes naturally to me. Uh, this has been tested, and they will not discuss uh, skull and bones in front of other people who are not members. It is totally a secret society. And then I found out that Yale had two other secret societies, Skull and Key and Wolf's Head. They're kind of weak sisters of um, skull and bones. I've also got their membership lists. In, in, I also got some internal letters between members, and between themselves, they, they talk about our order. Um, um, it's almost like the mafia, our thing, Cosa Nostra, our thing. It's How our you order. How escape their wrath? Here you are still walking around having exposed well, the whole order to easy. America. Um, you find it very difficult to find me. I know you do. I can't <laughs> see nobody how the, knows where I live. I can't see how the order would find it difficult to find you. Well, 
They've not found me yet. <laughs> <laughs> and none, none in this room. <laughs> um, so, so what I did, I, I took some key names, uh, names like Stimson and uh, Bundy and Bush, and I traced the political actions of these people. And by tracing the political actions through even establishment history, you could identify certain clear concepts. One is that they have backed, backed both sides of a number of wars. They backed Nazi Germany. They backed Soviet Russia. We talked earlier this evening about the build-up of the Soviet Union. Okay, the, the, the attorney who submitted um, a memorandum to Woodrow Wilson recommending the recognition of the Soviet Union and assistance to the Bolshevik Russia was none other than William Thatcher. Thatcher is a member of the order, Skull and Bones. Um, they don't, you don't find their members in large numbers. What you find, all key organizations have a key member in place. Uh, whether it be the Council on Foreign Relations, Trilateral Commission, the Atlantic, the Atlantic uh, uh, what, Association. What about the National Security Council? Oh, yes. Can you name the person? Uh, I can name CIA. Van Dyne uh, it was in CIA. William Buckley. And another interesting thing, um, I, I can't remember offhand to answer your question. I answered it with CIA. But know that we're talking about left and right. And I find that um, William Buckley, conservative in quotes, is a member. But so is the Reverend Sloan Coffin who's way on the left because he organized the anti-Vietnamese war resistance. In fact, it was William Buckley's club that selected William Sloan Coffin in the next club. So here we establish the phony right and the phony left. You find they represent the representatives on the right, the representatives on the left. Now, there used to be a Marxist journal, um, oh, I think, the Monthly Review, that was founded by the order. A Marxist journal? Marxist journal. It, it's a very important Marxist journal because it, it is the link between the old Marxists of the 1930s and the new progressives which came up in the 50s and the 60s. The Monthly Review was actually founded by Matheson, who's a member of Scott and Bones. They financed it. That's on the left. On the right, Time Life Fortune. That massive complex was founded and financed by 22 members of Scott and Bones. That's a lot of members. Well, they need a lot of money. Twenty-two of them. They need a lot of money. It's <laughs> cheaper to finance a Marxist journal than a Time Life and Time Life Fortune. <laughs> um, you find what you find is the key people uh, or members in key places, and their influence is felt. Then another thing I found: so all right, they they operate this phony left-right. They create wars. There's no question about that. I find continuity. A good example is the Bundy family. William Bundy if I can recall, was Secretary of War under Roosevelt in World War II. At the end of World War II, he pulls in his two sons, William Bundy and McGeorge Bundy. They, in turn, under Kennedy and Johnson, become National Security Advisor to the President and, I think, Assistant Secretary of Defense. So you find continuity within families, the Simpson family the same way, uh, the Bush family. Uh, this is how they perpetuate their political control. So basically what you've got is secret societies within the Ivy League universities, because the equivalents existed at um, Princeton and Harvard, within the Ivy League universities. They control power, they are self-perpetuating, therefore their deficiencies, their ideas, and their weaknesses are also self-perpetuating, as I see it. This, I think, explains why so many things about our foreign policy uh, go wrong. Uh, that, very briefly, is the order. I still have to get to the Harvard and the Princeton components. But I think Skull and Bones, the, the Yale component, is probably 25% of the establishment. When I've looked at Harvard and uh, Princeton, will have probably 80% of the establishment. Do you have uh, the information on I Harvard? I have the membership list, yes. It's a matter of finding the time to... I think America needs this information out. <laughs> I think you better get it out. The, the, problem, the problem is researchers are very slow 
expensive process. I have four book contracts at the moment. Um, you know, I was very happy to come here, but I don't make many public appearances. We're uh, very honored that you decided to come. Well, I'm very happy to be here. As, as I was saying earlier, as I was saying earlier, um, I'm not a speaker, um, and I'm not really a writer. I'm basically a researcher. So any faults I'm making speaking or writing, I can just excuse by saying that's not my business. Basically, I'm a researcher. Um, that's a neat cop out, but uh, it, it happens to be the truth. Uh, but see, the analysis of this material takes so long, and. I think I'm the only one who can do it. Uh, I have good assistants, but you know, you, you, when, when one is in this for so long, you recognize patterns which no one else would recognize, or you recognize names which no one else would see the significance of. So hopefully, in maybe five years or so, I'll get around to finishing off the order series. Well, the order on education was extremely helpful. And that I had to write very quickly because I'm not an authority on education, but the pattern came out very clearly through Galladay and um, going back to, the, to Germany, um, uh, the uh, German educational philosophy of the 19th century. So, how do you see the order in Eustech? Well, again, uh, the order has its men in Eustech. Um, it um, they're in place. Um, Avril Harriman, for example, was a, um, a member of Skull and Bones. Brown Brothers Harriman, I think out of 16 partners in Brown Brothers Harriman, uh, 10 are members of Skull and Bones. Brown Brothers Harriman is a very important member of your stake. It's the driving force behind it. That's the investment bankers in New York. So yeah, you'll find a lot of people in Eustake are not members of Ivy League universities. But the basic drive behind it comes from these old-line elitist establishment people. There's that bridge. You have a little more difficulty with the Trilateral Commission because that was founded by David Rockefeller and traditionally the Rockefellers have gone to Harvard, not Yale. So we'll have to put that on hold till I get out the Porcelain Club, which is the Harvard Secret Society, and then the Rockefellers turn up on the membership list there. But I haven't done the analysis yet. Have you turned up anything comparable in the Soviet system? No. The Communist Party would be the closest. They have nothing comparable in their educational system. If you want to get ahead, of course, the way to do it is join the Communist Party and work your way up through the ranks and become a Gorbachev or a drop-off. That's still the way to do it in the Soviet Union. 